Hi, I'm Tim Doria of Boston Decision. Today's presentation is text mining of Romney and Obama speeches. How to build a machine learning system in R that uses text mining to predict the author of a document or speech. The intended audience for this presentation are business folks who are looking to learn a little bit more about text mining, how it could potentially apply to their business, and who want to see text mining in action. Does it really, really work? Um, this is more of a business presentation. We're going to have a separate technical presentation where we go through the details of the code to replicate the types of things that we're doing here today. That will be at a later time. Now, who are we? Boston Decision is a leading data mining and predictive modeling consultancy here in the Boston, Cambridge area. If you go to Google or Yahoo.com and you type in predictive modeling in Boston, we'll come up number one across the search engines. We do the types of things that we demonstrate here, and we like to implement these types of functionalities and services into companies across industries. So if you see something that interests you, give us a call. 80% of all global data is unstructured, and that's according to an IBM report put out in 2010. Unstructured data consists of information that doesn't fit neatly into rows and columns of a spreadsheet or table. This could be unstructured text data, uh, audio, video, and the like. Now some examples of text-based unstructured data could be Twitter streams, blogs on a website, electronic medical records, the majority of which is unstructured text, invoices, and the list continues. We're effectively surrounded by unstructured text data. Now the idea for this presentation came from another presentation we were designing for the Data Mining for Marketers Meetup in Cambridge a few months back. It was called Flip Flopometer whereby we were developing a system to detect when presidential uh, candidates flip-flop on the issues. In the course of putting that presentation together, we found that there were certain common traits that persisted from one speech to the next within candidates. And so we decided we wanted to explore that a little bit further. Um, is there a hallmark linguistic pattern or a set of position on issues or terms and phrases that a candidate will use across speeches that could serve as a fingerprint whereby if we're given a speech we can use and identify that fingerprint, that fingerprint to allow us to predict who said the speech. Uh, that was the goal and that's what this presentation is about. Now, what we're going to be developing is a machine learning system whereby we're going to feed it in a speech where we don't know the author, we want it to go into the system, and then the system is going to spit out a name. And hopefully that name will be of the candidate who said that speech. Now, why is it that we're doing this? What are some of the commercial implications of this technology? I mean, at the surface, it certainly can help identify who said a speech, and that could have implications in plagiarism detection, uh, brand management to ensure that multiple writers generating content for some website uh, are all um, in alignment with the brand strategy and have a consistent message. Those are obvious applications. But if we look at and substitute different forms of text and uh, predict different items than what we are looking at here, we can actually use this same system and expand out to a lot of other problems and industries. Uh, some examples are if we were to change the text instead of speeches we were to look at the physician narratives of an electronic medical record. That's the part of the medical record where the physician types in in free text what they see and hear about the patient. And then we were to align that to predict healthcare costs. Well now you have a system where you can feed in text and then get an estimate of what is this patient going to cost over time or what is the probability slash likelihood that a particular patient might get sick or come up with come down with a chronic illness over the next five ten years if we were to look at what a user enters into a website we can use that to predict the identity of the user is the information and the interaction a particular user is having with the website con consistent with what we already know of that user we could look at the product descriptions for items in an online shopping cart and use that predict, predict and identify cross-sell opportunities. What other items might this person be interested in if they already have placed this into their online shopping cart? We could look at invoice notes, so for example from a consultant on the services that they rendered and we could use that to identify are we being overcharged? Or we could look at Twitter data 
and use that to predict when a flu outbreak might be occurring. This is something that Google uh, uh, began doing with its search engine, looking at search data uh, and trying to correlate that with flu outbreaks. So text data has a lot of information and we can use it in different ways to gain insight that wouldn't otherwise uh, be there. So for this uh, presentation, uh, our data comes from two sources, obamaspeeches.com and mittromneycentral.com. And the technology that we're using consists of two pieces. The first is R, which is a data analysis uh, package language uh, that's freely available. It's open source and has a lot of libraries developed by folks like you and I. Um, that extends its functionality. And then we also used R Studio, which is a development environment for R. It's completely free. It's also developed by a company here in the Boston, Cambridge area. We really like this tool. So the way we stored the speeches for this example is we took one speech, stored it into a file, put that file into a directory that had the uh, candidate's name, and we repeated that process across about 32 speeches for Obama and about 36 speeches for Romney. Now a speech is simply free-flowing text. Here's an example of what one would look like. So you can see it doesn't fit nicely into rows or, or columns. Uh, it's free-flowing text. This is what we're going to analyze. The first step in doing a text mining uh, engagement, once you start looking and getting into the data, is to create what's known as a corpus. A corpus is simply a collection of documents whereby each document contains some text-based information. So in this case, a document is simply a file that contains a speech, and a corpus is going to be the collection of speeches. In this case, the directory that has the candidate's name on it. So we're going to have two corpuses developed for this project, one for Romney and one for Obama. The next step is we want to clean the corpus. Now, one of the questions you might have is, well, why are we creating a corpus in the first place? Well, the reason for that is it allows us to apply cleanup and other types of functions to all of the text documents in one shot without having to go through each one individually. So we apply functions to the corpus level. Um, now what does that really mean? Well, one of the things we might want to do is we might want to eliminate words that don't have value. So for example, articles or certain other parts of speech really don't lend themselves to us being able to establish who said a speech. So we might want to eliminate those from across all the documents at one shot. Upper and lower case really doesn't have any significance uh, in this analysis. And there's also phrases and terms that represent the same core concept but are presented in different forms. So for example, telephone, phone, phones, they're all the same core concept but they are spelled differently across our speeches. We want to standardize those and really have them represented by one core root term. So some examples of applying this is here's a before and after of removing punctuation and at the bottom here you see the function that we're using in R to remove that punctuation. Likewise, we could also convert all the text to lowercase. And we also want to remove stop words. Those are the words in the English language that really don't give have much meaning, don't give us much insight on who said a particular speech. So after we do the cleanup, the next step, and this is really where the magic happens, is creating what's called a term document matrix. What we do is we encode every speech on a column, and every term that appears in one or more speeches is shown on a row, one term per row. And then in the cells we simply note the frequency, the number of times that term has appeared in the speech on that column. So in this example here, leadership appeared one time in the first speech and appeared seven times in the third speech. Similarly, foreign, or the term foreign, appeared four times in speech one, one time in speech two, zero times in speech three. So this is what's called a term document matrix. Once we have the term document matrix, we often want to eliminate terms that don't really appear, appear all too often. Uh, these are called sparse terms. They might only appear in one document one time. They don't really give us all that much information. They're generally nonsense. We remove them since they slowed down our analysis, don't give any insight. So going back to our term document matrix, what we're going to do here when we build our algorithm is we're going to feed our machine, our process, these speeches encoded as a term document matrix. But we're also going to tell it and give it examples of who the speaker was for each of these speeches. 
So for example, speech one and speech two, we're feeding it the term document matrix and we're telling it who said these speeches. The goal is we then want it to learn the patterns between the speech and who said it and be able to apply that insight to new speeches where we do not give it the author or the speaker. That's what we're trying to do. Now the mathematical algorithm that we're using, that's really the intelligence behind the scenes here, is called a k-nearest neighbor algorithm. What this does is it takes in a new speech and it simply says, hey, what speech have I seen or learned from in the past that resembles this new one that I'm given? Because what it's doing is it's learning across the speeches where we told it the name of the, of the speaker. So it has those in memory. And it simply takes new speeches and says, hey, which, which speaker most closely resembles or which speech most closely resembles this new one? Who said that speech that's in my memory? Let me apply that name to this new, to this new document. That's, what's, that's what it's doing. It's, fail, it's fast. It's fairly simple, it's easy to conceptualize. The question is, is it accurate? Now in order to test whether or not this algorithm works and is accurate, what we're going to do is take a set of the speeches that we're using and that we're building this model with, and we're going to set them aside and not tell the machine, not tell the algorithm who said these speeches. This is called a holdout sample. The way that we're actually going to create this holdout sample is we have about 70 or so speeches that we're analyzing total. We're going to take 70% of those speeches and give them to the algorithm along with the name of who said those speeches. The remaining 30% we're going to give them to the algorithm, have the algorithm make a prediction of who said the speech, but we're not going to tell it who actually said the speech. Only after it creates a prediction will we compare the prediction to what we actually, who we actually know said the speech to measure how accurate is this model. So we run the model and you can see it's a very simple function call in R that we'll go into more detail in a later presentation. And this runs in microseconds and I'm using a fairly old machine that's more than six years old and has limited memory but yet it still runs in microseconds. So it's, um, that's one of the reasons why we decided to try out a k nearest neighbor algorithm as a first attempt. Now what are the results? One of the easy ways to view the results of a text or a data mining uh, analysis is what's called a confusion matrix. The way to interpret this is if we look on the left side here, these are the predictions that are made by the algorithm. Uh, what happens is we fed it a total of 19 test cases. That's the holdout sample where we didn't tell it who said the speech. And it made predictions for each one of those 19 about who said the speech. So 11 speeches it said were by Obama, and then it marked the other eight as Romney. If we look at the actual, the top there, those are who actually said the speeches. So the way to interpret this confusion matrix is that the machine predicted or the algorithm predicted that 11 of the speeches were said by Obama, and for each one of those 11 speeches that it predicted were Obama speeches, those 11 were indeed Obama speeches. For Romney, the machine predicted that eight of those 19 speeches were Romney speeches, and it will specifically identi identify each one and say, hey, this is an Obama speech, this is Romney. Eight of them it said were Romney. And of those eight that it said were Romney, all eight were indeed Romney speeches. And so if we do a simple accuracy calculation, we could see that in this first attempt, we had 100% accuracy. So this is one of those moments where you're kind of like, yeehaw, that's amazing. That's really cool stuff. But the question is, does this stand up to t over time? It could be that the machine got lucky in the test cases that we gave. It may have just been easy cases. So we have to repeat that random sampling. We have to repeat this process of testing new uh, speeches that it hadn't yet seen. And then only after we average together a bunch of these tests will we have a better sense of how accurate the machine is or the algorithm is. And this is what's known as or called validation. So after we repeated this whole process of sampling and giving it new test cases and averaging together the accuracy, the average accuracy overall after uh, 20 validation attempts was approximately 95%. So that's pretty cool given that this is a, uh, a very simple algorithm or not really doing all too much work here. Now the last step is if you want it to be really cool, you could create a scoring function. And what this does is it simply takes in the memory from the k-nearest-neighbor algorithm that we developed, and you give it a new speech, 
and it will then, based on that new speech, tell you who said it. Um, so we wanted to also take this a step further. We said, well, what happens if the speech wasn't in a file? What happens if it was online at a website? Well, we created a function where you could actually provide a file or a URL along with the memory of the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, and it will spit out who said that speech, either located at the URL or at the file. Uh, so this is just an, an exam, a simple example of the types of things that you can do with text mining. So the takeaways are that number one, despite variety in what candidates say across speeches, they tend to have a core fingerprint. In other words, candidates have a core uh, pattern, if you will, to their text that's persistent across speeches and across time. Text has a lot of buried information, and about 80% of the global data that we're exposed to is unstructured information, text being a type of unstructured information. And finally, systems that enable folks to automatically analyze text are within reach. All the tools that we used here today are open source technologies. There's no, no cost to licensing this, this type of technology. Uh, and it's very applicable to so many different problems as we showed in um, the commercialization slide. So with that being said, thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to speaking to any folks who have an interest in this field.